Well, I'm glad there were so many people here that were smart enough to come over here instead of to the Weehaw Lecture Theater like I did. <laughs> this is the second lecture in the series about cancer, and I think a particularly important one from the Institute's point of view because uh, Weehaw has taken a leading role in trying to understand the relationship for the last two decades between uh, apoptosis and cancer. And, of course, one of the leading figures in all the work has been Andreas Strasser, who, who due to his work, is now uh, both a, a member, a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science and an, an Australia, holds an Australia fellowship. So we're delighted to hear Andreas' overall perspective on, on the theme of cell death and cancer. Thanks a lot, Terry. So um, I was informed we have to... Uh, be out of here uh, pretty much on time because the high school students are going to come in and by looking at some of the faces, um, some of you might actually then be caught up and asked to do a second BCE or something, so you might want to escape. Um, maybe it doesn't apply to Jim over there. So um, today, as Jerry said, I'm going to give you a lecture on introductions into cell death and cancer. And um, essentially the outline of the talk is that... Uh, I'll not go through this in a very orderly manner, but I'll actually uh, mix the themes together during the talk. But at the end of it, I hope that you will have a very good uh, grasp of um, uh, what the purpose of cell death is in multicellular organisms, um, how it is regulated at the molecular level, and how defects in uh, cell death um, can contribute to the development of cancer, and, and importantly, how uh, defects in the cell death program can actually affect how um, uh, cancer therapies work or don't work, uh, depending on the cancer type and the type of therapy that you um, throw at it. So, as a very, very simple uh, means of introduction, this um, cartoon here shows what uh, the processes are um, within any multicellular organism or within any, any tissue that actually determine how many um, cells do we have in each tissue, and, and you could, of course, also think this of being a tumor rather than, than a normal tissue. And in essence, they are how many cells migrate into the, uh, the organ, how many cell divisions over time occur in that organ, and um, how many cells uh, will differentiate, uh, undergo senescence or terminal differentiation, uh, leave the organ, and, and of course, also the rate of cell death will have a lot to say on what the total cellularity of um, this tissue is. And if you remember Jerry's talk from last week, um, the beautiful diagram from Hanahan and Weinberg, which I'll use also later in my talk, of course, all of the processes that have to be undermined to go from a normal state into a cancerous state in one way or another directly influence these uh, processes here, that is, cellular division, cellular migration, cellular differentiation, um, senescence of cells, and, and, and uh, de cell death, of course. So cell death um, has been uh, discovered um, many times, but um, the discovery that actually then finally put it onto the map and um, convinced the community at large to devote a lot of time into researching the, the, the molecular mechanisms of cell death actually was done in, in Brisbane by, uh, by John Kerr and uh, later when he was in sabbatical um, joined by Andrew Wiley and uh, Jim Curry. Um, but you can see that already pictures from uh, Fleming's early microscopy in 1885 showed that um, cells can have features that we now uh, classically associate with apoptosis, and then on the, on the right side, you can see this in the um, <clears throat> electron micrographs from the elegant work of, um, of Kerr. So that the classical uh, features that we now associate with cells undergoing programmed cell death is that, that the cell shrinks, uh, that the chromatin condenses, uh, the DNA is cleaved. Of course, you can't see that by microscopy, but you can see it by uh, biochemical or now by enzymatic tests that we use frequently to actually determine that cells are, are undergoing apoptosis, uh, nuclear fragmentation, um, and then uh, something that you usually uh, only see in culture, that is that uh, the cell actually segregates into blebs or what we call apoptotic bodies, uh, because in vivo, within a tissue, as soon as a cell goes through only the early stages of apoptosis, most likely 
it gets recognized very rapidly by professional phagocytes or, or even non-professionals phagocytes that then engulf the dying cell and, and you will no longer uh, see it outside but on the inside of, of cells. So um, what, what is apoptosis used for? Um, so it, it's used for in multicellular organisms um, uh, very prominently um, during embryonic development. So for example, uh, it, it's seen in tissue regression in metamorphosis, um, uh, classically observed originally in amphibians and insects. It's required uh, for the proper sculpting of tissues within embryos. Um, such as what you can see here, the, the limb formation. And you can see that um, uh, depending on whether um, a, an individual animal or a species um, ends up with interdigitating cells or not, there's a cell death occurring between uh, the digits in the mouse where you have individualized digits. The cells die. In the um, duck, of course, uh, they don't die, whereas in the chick, again, they do die. Um, Cell death is also prominent in um, the homeostasis in adult tissues where you don't really increase the, the mass or the number of cells in a tissue very much. And uh, examples where a lot of cell turnover and therefore a lot of cell death does occur is in the intestine, in the adult, uh, the skin of course, and uh, to a lesser extent also in, in the liver. Um, Cell death also features highly prominently in, uh, in the immune system, uh, both within the adaptive immune system as well as, as within uh, the innate immune system. And, uh, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, it's also used um, for the removal of, of, of cells that have sustained uh, uh, damage. And I'll put in one example here, and that is um, something that happens when you go to the beach in summer and that is the UV um, radiation-induced um, killing of cells. Um, I just want you to concentrate. I should have brought a pointer here. I want you to um, concentrate here on... Oh, you can see it, actually. Um, those two panels here. So this is um, unstimulated um, uh, skin, not UV exposed, and here at the, just below it is a cell's um, skin from a mouse that has been exposed uh, to UVB radiation. And you can see that a large number of the cells in the epidermis have been lost, and uh, most of that death can be ascribed to, to apoptosis. As I mentioned already, um, our bodies on a daily basis also remove millions of other cell types in other tissues, such as the epithelial cells within our intestines, uh, plus millions of white and red blood cells once they have completed their job or have become uh, damaged in one way or another. Okay, here we are. So um, cell death also features very prominently in the immune system, and um, in, in essence, um, it serves the purpose of uh, removing cells at a time when they're no longer needed. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Um, but also if cells are potentially or, or actually dangerous. And um, the purpose of this is um, to protect individuals such as us from developing either autoimmune diseases or um, also um, cancers of white blood cells, um, leukemias or, or lymphomas. Because you could imagine that um, if you have a large number of highly dividing um, lymphocytes at the end of an immune response, and if they keep dividing and persisting, the risk that they might acquire certain oncogenic mutations uh, would be a realistic um, hazard to, to developing uh, leukemias or lymphomas. So this uh, cartoon shows um, in, in red, um, an acute um, infection with, for example, a virus. You can see that the viral titer in the body uh, rises dramatically over time. Um, after a certain lag time, the immune response kicks in. Um, in this case, uh, I've drawn a cytotoxic T cell response as being responsible for actually killing the virus infected cells, purging the body of the pathogen. Once uh, the pathogen has been removed, it makes a lot of sense to remove the antigen-specific T cells um, because um, these antigen-specific T cells, just by chance, some of them might actually be cross-reactive to self-antigen, which would cause collateral damage that could be um, unacceptable for survival of the species. Um, also, as I mentioned, they could be 
um, considered to be a forerunner of, of neoplastic transformation. So therefore, uh, actually at an, um, <clears throat> the termination of an acute immune response, more than 90% of the antigen-specific cells uh, rapidly die, and, and most of that death can be ascribed to, to apoptosis. Um, now this is the consequence, or this can be the consequence if, if this process doesn't actually occur the way that it's meant to occur. And uh, this disease here, this um, child here, uh, suffers from what is called ALPS, uh, which uh, is an abbreviation for autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome. Um, I'll come back to the molecular details of what causes disease a little bit later, but suffice to say at this time that um, this disease is due um, to the absence of the expression of a, of a receptor on the surface of the lymphocytes that is uh, required for killing um, T cells and also B cells at the time when they have to be killed at the end of an immune response. Um, the consequences for the individual is that they have too many lymphocytes. This causes what's called lymphadenopathy and, and splenomegaly. Um, they also um, very often suffer from severe autoimmune pathologies um, such as autoimmune anemia, thrombocytopenia, and uh, glomerulonephritis. In the, in the very severe um, cases, um, the, the only way to save these um, kids is by uh, bone marrow transplantation. But um, there's a very large gradation of the severity of this disease, and some of them spontaneously recover. Um, some of them can be treated just simply by glucocorticoids or immunosuppressive agents um, for a while, and, and they get better when they go into teenage years. Uh, this is the other type of, of disease that I mentioned that you can get. This is lymphoma. This is a picture of a, of a man who's suffering from a, a disease called a follicular center lymphoma, or a B-cell type of, of, of lymphoma, and you can see the swollen lymph nodes in the areas of, of his axillaries and, and in, the, in the neck most prominently here. So I'll, I'll turn uh, at this time now to giving you a background of the molecular mechanisms um, of what we know today about um, cell death signaling. And um, it's actually uh, this type of disease, this type of, of, of patients that has actually started um, the whole um, understanding, the molecular understanding of, of programmed cell death. So it, it turns out um, that uh, most cases of, of human follicular central lymphoma, um, which is what this patient is suffering from, 90%, um, uh, some numbers say even higher, have a characteristic chromosomal translocation, which is shown on the left here, which uh, brings a gene that at that time was not known, and because it was a B-cell lymphoma that uh, the people who were doing the cytogenetics on that cancer um, called it B-cell lymphoma gene number two, BCL2, because they've already solved one chromosomal translocation before, which was BCL1. But uh, bear in mind that the BCL1, 2, 3, 4 genes, um, they're actually not related at all in function. They just come from different B-cell lymphoma types where cytogeneticists have solved which genes are involved in the chromosomal translocations. So this was the second one that was discovered in the lab of Carlo Croce. They called it BCL2. The consequence of the chromosomal translocation is that this gene um, BCL2, which was not known at that time, becomes subject to the regulatory sequences of the immunoglobulin heavy chain um, gene. The enhancer is called EMU. And as a consequence of that, the levels of BCL2 in B cells that have this translocation was much higher than it normally should be. Uh, the sequence of, or the coding sequence of the gene was, was not um, found to be mutated in, in these lymphomas. So it was thought that it was just too much of this protein um, that was causing um, the, the consequences of, of this uh, disease. Work, extremely elegant work by David Vo, Suzanne Corey, and, and uh, Jerry Adams here at WeHi, then for the first time revealed what the function of BCL2 was. Initially, it was uh, proposed that it would be a gene like all other oncogenes that had been known at that time, that it would drive cellular proliferation. Um, in fact, uh, BCL2 does not do that uh, at all. Um, but what it does is it allows cells um, 
to resist um, cell death stimuli that would kill cells that do not overexpress BCL2. So the important messages from uh, this work was that um, cell survival is, is controlled genetically by a different mechanism than um, cellular division is, is regulated. And um, importantly for cancer, that um, defects in programmed cell death machinery can contribute um, to tumor development. And this is the main topic of the talk, of course. Now, um, BCL2 overexpression on its own, which is shown in this graph here as the light blue line, is actually um, a very um, wimpy oncogene. Um, the um, survival curve for these mice here goes only to about 100 days. If you wait long enough, um, BCL2 transgenic mice do develop uh, lymphomas, but the incidence is somewhere, uh, somewhere around 5 to 10 percent in the first year of life, which is significant, uh, but not, not impressive. Um, however, if you combine uh, overexpression of BCL2 with certain other oncogenic lesions, such as shown here, um, deregulated expression of MYC, which makes cells divide when they shouldn't divide, then um, it reveals a potent ability to synergize in, in neoplastic transformation. So the, the message from this is that um, probably um, blocking apoptosis or certainly overexpression of PCL2 um, is um, oncogenic in the sense that it keeps cells alive that are normally programmed to die. And by keeping them alive for a longer time, it increases the risk of uh, that cell or that group of cells acquiring additional oncogenic mutations, which could be uh, more potent and which uh, by themselves would not suffice to transfer for, for cellular transformation, but then together with a block and apoptosis, um, you start the process. Um, at pretty much the same time as this work was done in the mouse and, and in the human, and the first cell death gene, namely BCL2, was being discovered, um, very elegant studies were done in uh, Boston in the lab of, of Bob Horvitz, um, who was studying a very simple a model organism, C. elegans, a, a nematode, and uh, who was doing mutagenesis studies to identify the genes that were required and, and um, sufficient for the um, um, program death of the somatic cells that happens uh, in a very stereotypic manner in this organism. So it's um, C. elegans, the mature organism always has 1,090 cells, that is somatic cells. It has uh, many more um, uh, germ cells. And out of the 1,090 cells, um, it's always 131 that are programmed to die, and it's always the same ones that are programmed to die, and they always die at exactly the same uh, developmental stage. So the mutagenesis program that they did identified um, four genes um, that are essential regulators of um, uh, programmed cell death, and they're shown here. Um, and um, SET3 is essentially a destroyer. Uh, it turns out that it is um, a protease, uh, a cysteine protease, and I'll give you a bit more detail on that in the next slide. Uh, SET4 is an activator of this uh, protease. Um, SET9 inhibits the programmed cell death pathway, and most excitingly, it turned out um, that SET9 was nothing else than uh, C. elegans homologue of uh, human BCL2. And of course, once that realization came about independently from Michael Hengartner and uh, David Wo, who at that time was um, in uh, San Francisco, at, at, well, at Stanford actually, um, it became clear that the basic uh, mechanisms <coughs> of cell death in the two organisms must be the same, and therefore that whatever we learn in one, we can most likely transfer directly into the other uh, system. Okay, I told you that um, uh, SET3 is a cysteine uh, protease um, called the caspase now, and that um, in C. elegans, it's um, absolutely essential for the demolition and the death of the cells. So um, subsequent to that, uh, of course, there was a hunt for finding caspases in, in mammals, uh, most of well, humans and mice mostly, 
And it's now apparent that um, uh, mammals have approximately 15 caspases. Um, importantly, it has to be remembered, not all of them play a role in programmed cell death. Some of them do play a role in programmed cell death uniquely, and some others actually play a role in programmed cell death and in other cellular processes as well. So when you hear about caspases, um, one of the questions you've got to ask yourself is, well, which one of uh, these groups of, of um, sustained proteases is somebody talking about? Is it one that is uniquely involved in cell death, cell death something else, or only something else? <clears throat> so um, the way that caspases um, work is now um, worked out by structural um, work as well as by biochemical work. Um, in many labs, such as Guy Salverson's very um, Chai Dong Wang, extremely elegantly. Um, so these uh, proteins are made, like most proteases, um, as cymogens. That means as inactive uh, precursors, so they don't have any enzymatic activity or very, very low enzymatic activity. Um, they become active um, if they are um, changed in their conformation, and this is where the adapter protein that I mentioned before, set 4, comes into play. That's what it does. It binds to set 3 and changes its conformation so that it becomes enzymatically active. So by structure, you can divide caspases um, into two groups, the so-called initiator caspases, such as set 3. So these are the ones um, that can become activated by conformational change, by binding to a specific adapter. Um, in mammals, but not in C. elegans, we have a group of caspases that are uh, termed defector caspases that work in the pathway um, directly downstream of the initiator caspases. And um, examples of that are caspase 3, 6, and 7. Um, they cannot be activated by uh, adapter proteins or by conformational change. Uh, they are essentially activated when the upstream or the initiator caspases cleave them in two positions. That allows them to be reconfigured and then they become active. Um, the ultimate consequence of this cascade of um, caspase activation is that a multitude of proteins within the cells, is literally hundreds of cells, are being cleaved, and I just mentioned a few of these um, proteins here at the bottom, and this brings about the demolition and the collapse of, of the cells. Okay, just briefly here, that I mentioned that um, the initiator caspases have to be activated by conformational change, and in, in C. elegans, in the case of the caspase Z3, this is um, achieved by Z4. In, in mammals, we have clear um, functional and structural homologues of Z4, and I've uh, listed just one of them here, which is um, APAF1, which, like Z4, it has a CAR, the so-called caspase recruitment domain at the amino terminus, um, a nucleotide binding domain, and then, um, in contrast to Z4, it has additional regulatory sequences towards its, its um, carboxy terminus. Um, this um, APAF1 was discovered by Shai Dong Wang about 14 years ago now. Um, in contrast to Z4, a mammalian APAF1 requires um, to become fully activated, uh, to become capable of, of um, activating um, its caspase, which is caspase 9, um, the, the um, co-activator cytochrome C and the ATP. Now, of course, cytochrome C is normally kept in the intermitochondrial space in healthy cells, so that already um, um, informed the field and was confirmed later on by work, for example, of, of Ruth Cluck, um, that um, mitochondrial outer membranes have to be uh, damaged sufficiently so that um, cytochrome C can actually get out from the space between the inner and the, uh, the outer membrane um, to get into the cytosol where APAF1 and um, the caspase 9 or the caspase 9 precursor reside. So um, if we look at this all together, then we, we can make the conclusion that the um, the, the apoptotic machinery um, is, is basically highly conserved um, between mammals and C. elegans, um, although, of course, as you might expect for a, a more complex organism uh, such as man or, or mouse, uh, it, it's 
has many more bells and whistles than it has in, in the nematode. And that means that um, for each uh, of the genes where in C. elegans there is only one, um, the mammals have um, several in general, um, which means that there is a functional redundancy which allows a, a much more subtle control of, of the cell death machinery, which allows um, like cell type specific death mechanisms to operate or also um, cell death stimulus specific mechanisms uh, to be in operation. Okay, I'll um, give you now an introduction in the other major players in the apoptotic program and, and some, some examples of, of what I consider to be um, uh, hallmark discoveries that actually made us um, realize what these proteins do. So <clears throat> amongst the BCL2 protein family, we now know that uh, there is about 20 of these proteins and we can subdivide them uh, into at least three um, functional subgroups that are also structurally um, somewhat uh, different. So the first uh, group I'll turn to is the pro-survival members of the family. Uh, this includes BCL2, BCLXL, uh, BCLW, MCL1, and A1, and, and probably also uh, BU, also the, also, which is also called DIVA, although that has not uh, been studied by uh, gene targeting very well yet. Um, these proteins at the <clears throat> amino acid uh, level share up to four regions of homology. And there you will hear them in the literature to be referred to as BH1 to 4 regions, which just means BCL2 homology region uh, number 1 to 4. Um, at the bottom, I've shown you the uh, crystal structure of BCLXL, which was uh, solved 15 years ago now um, at Abbott by uh, Steve Muchmore and, and colleagues. And you can see the, the globular uh, structure of this um, protein. Importantly, um, all of the proteins are listed above here have been uh, targeted by homologous recombination in yes cells. And um, um, these studies showed that um, the different pro-survival family members are required for survival of different uh, cell types. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit more detail on that now. Um, as an example, when you... Um, Knockout BCL2, which was done uh, first in Stan Korsmeyer's lab and in Dennis Lowe's lab. Um, also, which I forgot to mention a paper here. Um, the consequence is that the mice um, uh, lose important uh, stem cells within the developing kidney. As a consequence of that, they get uh, polycystic kidney disease. This is not an autoimmune kidney disease. This is just a developmental uh, problem with the kidney. Um, as a consequence of that, the mice um, don't grow normally. They uh, show a runting phenotype, which you can uh, see here. Uh, what you can't see here is that if the mice live long enough, they become prematurely gray. And um, also the mice um, have uh, many fewer lymphocytes than a normal mouse uh, would have. And at least on this genetic background, like six, um, all of these animals are dead by about 40 days um, after birth. Um, if you knock out BCLX, um, then uh, the problems are even more severe. Uh, the mice are not even born. They um, all die around in E15 of development. Um, uh, the reason they die is, uh, is actually two. Um, they can't make sufficient numbers of um, erythroid cells in the fetal liver, and that's, of course, uh, fatal. Uh, but they also have severe neuronal abnormalities um, in the brain. And um, uh, you can actually, with other genetic manipulations, um, prevent uh, the erythroid uh, death, um, the premature erythroid death, but that doesn't save the animals because um, the neuronal, the abnormal neuronal death still um, will kill them. A BCLW seems to have an essential role um, only in, in male um, germ cells during spermatogenesis. Um, a1 is a very complicated one. We have a, a very poor understanding of, of, of A1's function. The reason is that although in the human we have only one A1 gene, in the mouse uh, we have four A1 genes. One is a pseudogene, but the other three are actually expressed. Um, although they are closely localized to each other, they're also interspersed with other genes. So uh, targeting all of the A1 genes by homologous recombination is... Um, almost impossible, and 
therefore has not yet been done. So only one of the three expressed genes has actually been knocked out, A1A. Uh, the consequence is that uh, you have um, abnormally increased death of, of granulocytes and allergy, allergen-activated mast cells. But I, I would predict from the expression pattern of A1 that if you would knock out all A1 forms, you would get much more interesting and, and more severe uh, defects. MCL1 um, appears to be the most important of the pro-survival genes, judging from the severity of the phenotypes that you see. So if you knock it out in all tissues, um, you, you don't even go past E3 of embryogenesis. There, there's a, a, a defect in implantation, and that's the end of the development. Um, MCL1 has been deleted in specific cell types, and it turns out that in almost any cell type, when you delete MCL1, you get very significant defects um, that are highly interesting. Um, for example, if you knock it out in hemopoietic stem cells, the stem cell compartment collapses. If you knock it out in mature B or T lymphocytes, their numbers drop um, dramatically. If you knock it out in, in neurons, there is um, severe neurological abnormalities in the animal, etc., etc. So, in conclusion, uh, from a huge amount of work um, that I summarized here, um, one can conclude safely that uh, the survival of every cell type probably requires at least one of these proteins, uh, possibly in some cases also um, two or, or maybe three, and that, that is uh, certainly still being examined. So the second um, subgroup uh, of the BCL2, the larger BCL2 family that I want to um, come to is the Bax back um, group, which also contains um, BOC, which is only very, very poorly studied. Um, at the amino acid um, sequence level, these um, proteins um, seem to have um, very similar structure to um, the pro-survival proteins. And also when you look at the structure shown here at the bottom, which was solved by Suzuki, Chandra, and Yule at the NIH 11 years ago now, um, it looks remarkably similar to, to BCLXL. And um, this is still actually a huge conundrum in, in the field because the pro-survival proteins, as I just told you, are essential for cell survival. Uh, backs and back, which I'll show you on the next slide, are essential for cell killing. Uh, why do they look the same, at least um, to us in this state? And, and this will can go into a lot of discussions on this, but I guess it tells you that a frozen structure of something in liquid uh, may not always be a, a true reflection of what the protein really looks like, where it does the job. Now, where <coughs> do BAX and BAC do their job? Um, in healthy cells, uh, uh, BAX is, is mostly found in the cytosol. Some is in the um, attached to the, loosely attached to the outer mitochondrial membrane. BAC is mostly um, already in the healthy cells, bound loosely to the outer mitochondrial membrane. But when BAX and BAC actually doing their job, that is during the initiation of, of the destruction of the cell, they actually insert into the mitochondrial outer membrane and form oligomers there. And of course that is, is their active state. And of that active state, we don't actually have a photography yet. And we don't have any crystal structures of that or NMR pictures. And, and the hope is that uh, once we can achieve this, we'll actually understand how uh, Bax and Bac really work at the, at the molecular um, level. So as already uh, foreshadowed, um, uh, Bax and Bac are essential for um, cellular apoptosis, and uh, this is one really um, very important experiment that was done 11 years ago now that, that actually proved that. Um, what you can see here is that um, when you take mouse embryo fibroblasts, uh, such as wild-type cells in the open um, squares here, um, and you enforceably express um, a pro apoptotic protein such as BIM, then uh, within a relatively short while, 100% of the cells are dead. Um, if you do this in backs or back single knockout cells, uh, there is uh, minor or no protection um, however, if you do the same experiment in back-to-back -back double knockouts, which is the lower curve here, the, the 
uh, boxes with the stripe through it, um, then these cells are essentially completely protected from this death. So not only from such relatively artificial means of inducing cell death does combined loss of VAX and VAC protect. It also protects cells, many cell types that were studied, um, from much more physiological stimuli such as glucocorticoids, uh, growth factor withdrawal, um, the list goes on. So this tells us that the combination of VAX and VAC, uh, they have largely overlapping activities and that this activity, uh, combined activity, is absolutely essential for, for cell death. Um, the inference also is that um, it must, VAX and VAC must work um, downstream of the initiating um, stimulus such as uh, BIM. I'll introduce BIM and its colleagues to you in the next slide. Um, but it must work upstream of cytochrome C, which, as I told you, is the co-activator of um, uh, the um, FF1 adapter protein and, and caspase 9, to t which then turns on uh, the caspase cascade. So these are the BH3-only proteins, which is the third major subgroup of the overall BCL2 protein family. Um, according to our lab, there's eight of these proteins in mammals. Uh, other labs include several other proteins in, in this group. Um, I can, in question time, answer why we don't include these other proteins, but um, these are the ones that we believe in. So these proteins, they, they're called BH3-only proteins because they share with each other and, and the wider family at large um, only one domain, namely the BH3 uh, uh, domain. And outside of that domain, they're very uh, largely different in amino acid um, uh, sequence and also in, in structure. Um, all of these um, uh, genes have been knocked out um, by homologous recombination in ES cells. And uh, the take-home message from that, and I'll give you two examples, is that uh, BH3-only proteins uh, function in, in a cell death stimulus-specific uh, manner, uh, but there's also a cell type specificity um, in, in the action of these uh, proteins. So one example is here, that is um, uh, the BH3-only protein uh, Puma. When it is deleted, then uh, it renders cells, and this as example here is, is uh, thymocytes, um, uh, profoundly resistant uh, to DNA damage, such as um, uh, imposed here by gamma radiation or by treatment with the cancer drug etoposide. Uh, the extent of protection is not quite that that is achieved by loss of the tumor suppressor P53, which is, is known to be um, absolutely critical for DNA damage-induced killing in, in non-transformed cells. Um, but if you knock out on top of tumor a second BH3-only protein that I showed in the previous slide, NOXA, then you get a full protection just as much as what you get with um, loss of P53. So this um, tells you that um, uh, these two um, genes are... Um, by themselves are completely sufficient uh, for all of P53's um, death-inducing activity. In contrast, um, if you uh, lose BIM, and this was very elegant work done by Philippe Bouillet when he was a postdoc with Suzanne and Jerry, is that um, you get, even in an unstressed state, a, a substantial increase in many types of leukocytes within the body of, of a mouse, uh, B cell numbers are up about threefold, T cell numbers are up, macrophage, granule site numbers are abnormally up, and, and over time, particularly the number of immunoglobulin secreting plasma cells go up a huge amount. Um, loss of BIM uh, does that because it renders cells um, uh, highly resistant to the death that you get by um, loss of cytokine support which probably is a, a major um, means by which cell numbers in the lymphoid system are um, managed within the spleen and, and, and the lymph nodes. So the overall um, take-home message from all of these um, knockout studies is shown in this slide here, and as I already foreshadowed, it, it really tells us that uh, BH3-only proteins 
um, A, they are the critical initiators of the apoptotic program. If, if you don't have um, BH3 only proteins, you cannot initiate cell death signaling. Um, in C. elegans, there's only one of them. This is the EGL1 protein that you might have seen on, on the previous slides. Um, if you knock out EGL1 in C. elegans, there's absolutely no cell death um, at all. Um, in mammals, as I said, it's more complicated. We have at least eight of these uh, proteins, and they work in a, in a cell death stimulus-specific manner. I showed you that Puma and, and Noxa are highly critical for DNA damage-induced killing. Um, they actually, or at least Puma, is critical for some other forms of cell death that have nothing to do with, with the tumor suppressor P53. Um, cytokine deprivation, which, which uh, many believe is a major way of, of regulating cell numbers in many tissues, um, maybe not surprisingly, activates a, a very large number of these BH3-only proteins through different transcriptional and post-translational mechanisms, which um, are actually mostly still not clear. Um, this involves, in the lymphoid system, most prominently BIM, and the second most important there is PUMA. Um, both cases, um, we really don't know how that activation actually works. There's a lot of papers, but um, most of them have some warts on them, and, and I think we really um, still have a lot of really exciting work uh, to be done to figure it out. And a really, really important um, discovery that was made um, simultaneously here at WeHi by um, David Wang's lab, um, Lin Chen, uh, Simon Willis, and many others, and in San Diego by Tomomi uh, Kuwana and uh, uh, Don Neumeyer, uh, was that um, at the biochemical level, the BH3-only proteins are actually not equals, um, as was uh, believed uh, before this work was done. Um, it turns out um, that uh, BIM and PUMA, and what is not shown here, um, activated BID, um, are very potent killers for the very simple and elegant reason that they can bind with very high affinity to all the pro-survival proteins. On the other hand, um, all of the other BH3-only proteins, and there's only two examples shown here, um, are um, not promiscuous binders, they're more selective binders. For example, NOXA can only bind and neutralize MCL1 and A1, which is not shown here, whereas um, <clears throat> BAD, uh, in contrast, does not bind to MCL1 and A1, but it binds to BCL2, BCLXL, and BCLW with very high affinity. And um, really elegant confirmation of, of that came that when you overexpress BH3-only proteins that are promiscuous binders, such as BIM or PUMA, uh, you get very potent killing. On the other hand, if you overexpress either BAD or NOXA alone, you get very poor killing. However, if you co-express two BH3-only proteins that have uh, complementary binding um, actions, such as BAD to neutralize BCL2, XL, and BCLW, and NOXA to take out MCL1 and A1, then you get a very potent killing, just as if you would overexpress uh, either BIM or PUMA. So, um, it appears that uh, the BH3-only proteins and uh, the pro-survival proteins um, act um, as pairs of, of proteins and uh, functionally interact with each other to do their job. And, and therefore, not surprisingly, um, it was found that um, these proteins actually bind to each other. And what you can see here on the um, uh, right-hand side, left-hand side, um, is um, the structure of BCLX with not an entire BH3-only protein bound to it, but actually just the BH3 domain of a pro BCL2 family member nestled into it. This is shown in, in gold here. So this um, binding is now widely believed um, to serve to inactivate the, the pro-survival activity of the uh, pro-survival BCL2 fam family members, such as uh, BCLXL in this case. Now, genetically, this has been validated really elegantly. I have shown you this um, slide here before. Um, 
just to remind you that um, if you have no BCL2 in a mouse, um, then all of these mice are dead uh, by no later than 40 days of age because of the runting from the polycystic kidney disease that they suffer. Now, Philippe's very elegant work has shown that um, all you have to do to rescue a BCL2 knockout mouse is to remove, and I stress, a single allele of proapoptotic BH3 only protein BIM, not both, just one. Just lower the dose by 50%, and rather than every mouse dying by no later than 40 days, now every mouse um, is able to live at least a year of, la um, of life. And the kidneys, as you can see here in the histology at the bottom, are completely normal, whereas um, on the um, left-hand side you can see the, the um, kidney from a, a sick BCL2 knockout mouse with the huge polycystic um, uh, cysts in it. Um, taking away one allele of BIM from a BCL2 knockout mouse uh, doesn't prevent the premature graying uh, because their melanocytes um, still die prematurely, or actually it's the stem cells of the melanocytes that die prematurely. But if you uh, remove both alleles of BIM, you can also cure them from this um, problem, which is obviously, as you can see around uh, the room, is not a fatal problem. Thank God. Okay. <laughs> Coming back um, uh, to cancer. So you've seen this um, really beautiful slide um, from this very famous review and, and very influential review from Hanan and Weinberg from Jerry last, um, last week. So it essentially says that um, to go from a normal state into a highly malignant state, cells have to acquire through mutations aberrations in a number of cellular processes, and, and ideally um, you mutate a number of processes that are ideally complementary to each other um, to achieve the transformed state. Evasion of apoptosis is, is, is one of these steps, and I'll, I shown you that um, the initial work that led to that was the discovery that the BCL2 gene is, is translocated um, in follicular lymphoma. Now, <clears throat> let's think about this a little bit more. So what are the actual examples of mutations in BCL2 family genes um, that are clearly validated in cancer? Uh, well, there's a few, but it's certainly not uniformly found in every cancer. So there's the the BCL2 IGH chromosomal translocation that I mentioned in follicular lymphoma. Um, about a quarter of mantle cell lymphomas and other B cell lymphoma has biallelic loss of BIM, the BH3 only protein that I mentioned. A silencing of the puma was found, uh, for example, due to hypermethylation, but can also be for other reasons. In some cases of Burkitt lymphoma, and most excitingly, a really nice paper last year in, in Nature. Um, showed that um, you can find in a large number of solid cancers somatic uh, copy number variations in MCL1 or BCLX. Um, this means you have more copies of these genes and therefore presumably um, higher levels of these proteins. Now, <clears throat> that's of course not absolute proof yet because the, the regions that were amplified were not just precisely MCL1 or BCLX. These are relatively large chromosomal regions which take contain maybe 50 genes, 100 genes or so, um, but at least in some cell lines from such cancers, they show that if you knock down by shRNA, MCL1, then the growth of these um, cells in culture at least is, is greatly impaired. I wouldn't say it's foolproof yet, but it's getting um, certainly very interesting and, and, and uh, strongly um, indicative that what they say is true. So I've highlighted here the genes that are val uh, clearly been shown to be targeted in human cancers that belong to the apoptotic program. So it's uh, BH3 only proteins, it's uh, BCL2 or MCL1 or BCLX, and in the DEF receptor pathway, which is um, the defect leads to this ALP syndrome that I showed you before, um, these kids that have mutations in either the DEF receptor FAS or um, the gene encoding the ligand, fast ligand, if they survive their autoimmune problems in a young age, 
then they're actually extremely um, uh, prone to developing um, lymphoid malignancies later in life. And later in life is not actually that late. It's in their 30s or, or 40s. So the, their risk of getting plasma cytoma or B-cell lymphoma is around 30%, if I remember well. Now, <clears throat> why, why aren't... Um, it's worthwhile to ask why aren't some of these other players here found to be mutated at high frequency in, in human cancers. And, well, one of them is that I would say, well, for backs and back, uh, I would argue, well, they have totally overlapping activities. So to make a cell totally deficient in that action, you would have to lose four alleles, two alleles of backs, two alleles of back. And that is probably a highly unlikely event to happen in a cell um, on its way to transformation, and the same can be achieved um, more easily by other mutations. Um, why is an FF1 of caspase 9 genes mutated in cancer? Well, the reason there is um, that it actually doesn't, uh, this loss of these proteins doesn't actually promote uh, or provide um, clonogenic survival, which means not only keeping the cells not looking dead, but not actually being a zombie and therefore not being of any danger anymore anyhow. So if you lose APAF1 or caspase 9, uh, the cells, they kind of don't look dead, uh, but they are dead. And therefore, in terms of uh, becoming a risk, a neoplasm is, is very low. And of course, with the caspases, again, further downstream, there is um, uh, the same argument because it's downstream of mitochondrial membrane permeabilization and therefore it just doesn't, doesn't matter. Okay, another um, reason why I think uh, not all um, tumors have uh, identifiable mutations in BCL2 family genes is that um, I would argue you can get uh, much more bang for your buck by mutating some other genes. And I've given just one example here. So the EGF receptor gene is mutated in, in a fraction um, of, of lung cancers. And of course, if you deregulate um, EGF receptor signaling, then yes, uh, you get, on the one hand, you get um, a pro-survival consequence of that because you repress, on the one hand, the action of BIM. You have less of this BH3 only protein uh, you also actually, which I haven't drawn here, is you have an increase in BCL XL levels. Um, but in addition to that anti-apoptotic consequence of that mutation, you also have um, more cell proliferation and you actually also can have impaired uh, cellular differentiation. So for either one BCL2 translocation or one mutation in the EGF receptor, which one is more potent? Well, it's pretty clear to me that... Um, mutating something that gives you a survival advantage and a proliferative advantage is probably going to be much more highly selected for during um, carcinogenesis. Or on the other hand, I, of course, the most important gene in, in human cancer is P53. It, it's mutated in 50% of all human cancers, and its pathway is, is actually deregulated in, uh, out of the other 50%, probably in 80% of these. So you could say maybe 90% of all human cancers have some p53 um, defects. Of course, there it's a tumor suppressor. You have to hit two alleles, but that can be achieved. But if you do achieve that, then, well, these are all of the processes um, that you get for, for many banks for two bucks. So I would say, again, this is why in many cancers, um, we don't find mutations in BCO2 family genes. It's because we can actually upregulate the pro-survival gene activity by some other mutations um, acting upstream or by losing the pro-apoptotic um, gene functions such as that of BIM or Puma um, by losing or mutating their regulators. And this is kind of said already here on this slide as well, and that is um, um, you can get increased expression of pro-survival BCL2 family members um, by some other mutations, and I, I think that is probably happening in many, many, many cancers. And, um, of course, the corollary of that is that uh, possibly the expression of pro-survival BCL2 family uh, proteins from unmutated genes may well be highly critical 
and essential for the development and also from a therapeutic perspective, more importantly, the sustained um, survival and expansion of many types of cancers that don't have a BCL2 chromosomal translocation or somatic copy number amplification of MCL1 or BCLX. And if we believe that, and, and, and certainly I do believe, um, then the, the corollary of that is that if we can make drugs that interfere with the expression of BCL2 pro for survival family members or inhibit uh, the function of these proteins, then that might become uh, a very useful strategy um, in, in cancer therapy. That brings me to the last um, three, four minutes of the talk, and that is um, cancer therapy. So what, what is the goal of cancer therapy? Well, of course, it has to be um, to kill 100% of the malignant cells, because if only a minor fraction, one in a million of uh, cancer cells in a human, um, that is still millions and millions of cells. If they escape the therapy, then there is a, a very real risk um, that that cancer rapidly or maybe not so rapidly will come back at some time and possibly because the, the patient and therefore the cells that have survived, the cancer cells that have survived the, the therapy have gone through mutagenic events, it'll come back with much more vengeance because there are additional mutations which surely have been selected for resistance for the therapies we have thrown at it. It turns out that many cancer therapeutics actually trigger apoptosis in, in tumor cells, and um, I wouldn't want to say that this is the only mechanism by which cancer therapeutics kill. Certainly not. There's many other forms of cell death. Um, we don't know as much about them, but uh, this is actually a very exciting time um, because there's a lot of new insight coming into non-apoptotic cell death pathways, and hopefully next year's lecture series there is somebody going to talk about um, that. Um, there's certainly been worked on by many people in, in WeHi, such as uh, John Silk and, and David Rowe. Um, now, it turns out um, from very elegant work, uh, some of it done uh, at, at WeHi actually put the wrong date in, it should be 2010, um, uh, for Lina's paper, and also Andy Willunger and, um, in Austria, or Ricky Johnson at the Peter Mac, that the BH3 only proteins are not only required in normal cells for their response to death stimuli, but they're also highly critical in many uh, tumor cells to the types of um, treatments that we throw at cancers. So under DNA damage, you can put dozens of chemotherapeutic drugs uh, that induce DNA damage, cisplatinum, etoposide, fludarabin, arabinoside, etc., etc. Um, all of them a lot of their killing action is dependent on the tumor suppressor P53 and therefore downstream on the BH3 only proteins, Puma and, and Noxa. Glucocorticoids, which are used in the treatment of many childhood leukemias, um, their killing um, is absolutely dependent on BIM and Punema. Um, HDAC inhibitors, uh, Taxol, go through BIM as well and to a certain extent BIM, BMF as well. Um, also turns out that actually uh, the novel designer chemotherapeutics, these are um, the drugs that are designed to inhibit the action of um, oncogenic proteins such as um, kinases like BCR able, um, which is the reason for the development of chronic myelogenous uh, leukemia development, kill cells by mechanisms that are absolutely dependent on the apoptotic program and require uh, BH3 only proteins. So Japanese guy, Junya Kuroda, showed elegantly that BIM and, to a lesser extent, BAD are absolutely essential for this killing. So, bearing that in mind, um, of course, one can think that uh, to directly activate rather than indirectly the apoptotic machinery might be a future perspective. And indeed, uh, there's now at least four approaches going into that way. There is the BCL2 pro survival family antagonist that, uh, that you've heard a lot about at WeHi, and you will hear actually in this lecture theory as well, so I will not go into detail. The BH, so called BH3 mimetics made by Abbott and Genentech with some help from us. 
Um, there's actually activators of the DEF receptor pathway that are also in clinical trial. These are antibodies that activate the trail receptors or recombinant uh, trail itself. And then there are also antagonists of the inhibitor of apoptosis proteins, um, the XIP protein, for example, but also CIP1 and 2. And probably I shouldn't have listed that as a direct activator, but um, drugs that can reactivate uh, dormant P53 are also in clinical development. And maybe that's a direct, maybe it's an indirect activator of the apoptotic machinery. So, of course, the advantage of doing that is that while the classical drugs activate the BH3 only proteins indirectly, as, as shown here and on previous slides, if you have a defect in P53, that uh, pathway is largely, if not completely, silenced. So if you can have a compound um, such as a BH3 mimetic, it can completely bypass the problem that is caused by not having a functional P53 protein anymore. And um, as I mentioned here, this is um, under development, and you'll hear a lot more from Andrew Roberts and probably also David Wang in, in their lectures about it. Uh, suffice to say that um, experiments that have been done so far at Abbott and, and also here are highly encouraging, and, and these compounds, some of these one of these compounds is now in, in clinical development. So the last slide is, is this one, and um, my prediction and, and prediction of many in our lab is that um, maybe the best um, future perspective, the excitement in, in cancer therapy field is um, to use direct activators of the apoptotic program, such as maybe IP inhibitors or, or, or BH3 mimetics, um, not by themselves. Um, they're probably not going to be um, sufficiently potent on their own in most cancers, but to combine them intelligently with other drugs. And in preclinical studies in, in, in mice um, and in tumor-derived cell lines in culture, it turns out that if you take any of the designer therapeutics that have been made to inhibit these oncogenic kinases and combine them with a direct activator of the apoptotic machinery, you can actually go from very little bang for your buck to extremely huge bang for your buck. And I predict that this is going to be um, um, maybe the biggest uh, revolution over the next 10 years. I certainly hope um, for that. So I'll uh, skip the summary and conclusions because I think I've um, said it all. I hope um, you've gotten it all, and um, I'd be very happy to answer questions. So, well, I guess if you find in genes a characteristic and recurrent change, such as a somatic copy number increase or chromosomal translocation, that is usually a very strong smoking gun that that gene is critical um, for the development and, and most likely the continued growth of that cancer. In the cases that I um, proposed where you have endogenous um, BCL2 or MCL1 being critical for continuing the growth of a cancer that is much more difficult. Um, in some of our own experiments, we have found that um, levels of MCL1, for example, do not seem to be much more high or even at all higher than what the normal cell counterpart expresses. Yet, if you remove the protein MCL1 from these cancer cells, they all drop dead. So I guess um, you... Bioinformatics can help a lot, but I would argue that at the end of the day, somebody got to get their hands dirty and do the actual experiment and see 
is this or that gene critical for the growth and the survival of the of the cell? So you can provide us the smoking gun, but we got to go and do it. So 50% of all cancers have mutations in both alleles of p53. The other 50%, most of those have um, mutation, either mutations in genes upstream, such as um, MDM2, which is one of the most important regulators of p53, or they have mutations in components downstream of, of p53, such as um, silencing of Puma that I mentioned in Burkitt lymphoma. Um, how exactly it happens in all of these cells, we, we, we don't know, but um, uh, if you want to know more, go and talk to Ross. He knows a hell of a lot more about that than, than I do. I believe there's a question over here. Um, we have a colleague that's currently on the plane, and he's still trapped with cancer cells, and Rob also the lymphoma cells. He says, if you have an increased number of amyloid protein in cancer cells, and you give this patient the drug that inhibits them, then obviously the normal cells are also. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, um, any BH3 mimetic or any any compound that will inhibit BCL2 or MCL1 will, of course, the way they're being delivered now, affect normal cells as well. So what clinicians are relying on in that case is, is the changes and well, differences in relative sensitivities of the cancer cells versus the normal counterparts, so hoping to find what is called a therapeutic window where you um, kill hopefully most or all of the cancer cells and not more of the normal cells um, that you damage the patient uh, too much. Um, <clears throat> of course, um, the, the biggest um, ventures towards directly attacking the cancer and nothing else than the cancer are these designer therapeutics that I mentioned a little bit, and you're going to get, I think, two or three more lectures about that, and that these, these inhibitors of oncogenic kinases. Um, certainly, BCR able is only present in a, in a CML patient in his CML tumor cells. It's not there in his normal or her normal cells. So if you can make a compound that attacks only BCR able and no other kinase um, within the body of that patient, then you have your highly 100% specific cancer therapeutic. It turns out that this has, at least for kinase inhibitors, has not been achieved 100%. I mean, they are, the drugs that are being used now are highly selective, but they're not 100% specific. So um, hopefully chemists will be able to... to to do that better. I mean, what I tried to indicate in my last slide is that um, perhaps the, the, the best approach is to uh, make idea, well, come up with the best um, working combinations of drugs so that you will have the least collateral damage with the best amount of killing within uh, the tumor cell population, and, and that just has to be determined by experiments first in preclinical models and then, of course, ultimately within human patients. But there is no um, way or undertaking that you combine you need the other children inhibit the cancer somehow with cancer cells. There is no... Well, there is... Um, you're too young to realize that, but there was a very long history in, in, um, in cancer therapy where people have tried to come up with what is called the magic bullet. And essentially what they did is to um, make antibodies um, that they thought would be highly specific for tumor cells and bind to nothing else than the tumor cells and then couple to those antibodies cytotoxic compounds. Of course, in those days, that was not BH3 mimetics, but those were... Um, more terrible things like ricin, for example, which you put in the tip in, of the umbrella if you want to kill a Bulgarian spy. But um, <laughs> all of these ventures, they, they failed um, 
uh, for a number of reasons. One was that these linkages were not tight enough and the rice intended to fall off and kill a lot of cells. And, and the other problem was that, uh, that there is no such thing as a tumor-specific antigen. I mean, Mark Smith is going to tell you the opposite of that, but I don't really believe that there is such a thing as a tumor-specific antigen. I mean, even the antibodies that were made against tumors that work now and are being used in cancer therapies such as the anti-CD20 antibodies, they're not specific to the tumor cells. Normal B cells have CD20, and if you give a patient CD20 therapy, yes, you wipe out the B cell lymphoma, but normal B cells go down south as well. So I think that is why this has failed. And um, as far as I'm aware, um, the pharmacological companies have almost entirely stopped that. Any follow-up questions? Well, let's just thank Andreas.